In a series of essays entitled On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History, historian Thomas Carlyle laid the foundation for what is today known as the Great Man Theory of History. The basic premise of the Great Man Theory is that history is a product of the actions of a few extraordinary men, which he refers to as heroes. In his essays, he profiles six examples of six hero archetypes, which you no doubt have heard of. The divine, the prophet, the poet, the priest, the man of letters, aka the writer, and the king. Within each essay, he explains the archetype, provides an example of an historical figure that represents that archetype, and explains how said figure changed history. Without knowing Carlyle by name, you probably still recognized the sentiment behind his quote, that in broad strokes, history is popularly conceived as the story of great men. So many of us subconsciously view history in this way. When we think of history, we often think in terms of the great historical figures that made an impact on the world, which on the one hand has a fairly logical rationale to it. After all, if you take your Einsteins, your Galileos, your Churchills and remove them from history, then the world would be a very different place. But on a more emotional level, the theory also captures humanity's psychological longing for heroic figures. It interrogates why we so often search for heroic symbolism in great men by deconstructing the heroic archetype and revealing what it is that makes men great to begin with. In this way, it isn't so much a theory about history as it is an explanatory framework about why hero worship seems to be a perennial feature of the human condition. Why is it that we need great men and what is greatness? This question is one of the core narrative focuses of Naughty Dog's groundbreaking action-adventure series, Uncharted. And with each game revolving around a singular great man of history and Nathan Drake's attempt to uncover their greatest exploits, it's hard not to see the influence of Carlyle's great man theory on the plot structure of the games. And though much has been said of Nathan Drake representing a more modern everyman take on the classic hero archetype, Nathan Drake's characteristics are similarly reflective of the historical hero archetype that Carlyle outlines in his essays. In Carlyle's Great Man Theory, he enumerates a number of features as being defining aspects of greatness, but there are three features of greatness in particular that I find most readily represented in Uncharted's story, religiosity, sincerity, and detachment. Religiosity is the most foundational feature of greatness in Carlyle's Great Man Theory, and it is also appropriately the defining characteristic of Nathan Drake himself. This might seem like a strange claim to make, as while there are plenty of supernatural elements in Uncharted's story, there isn't a heavy emphasis on the metaphysical. True, Nate was partially raised in a Catholic boy's home, but it's fair to say that Catholicism is not a defining feature of his life, nor does he seem to subscribe to any official religious doctrine. But nonetheless, like all great men, Nathan Drake still possesses deep religious conviction. Carlyle doesn't define religion in the literal sense. Rather, religion is meant to mean one's creed or code, the belief system that one lives by. In his essays, he describes religion as being essentially the first principle of human existence, from which everything else is derived. From religion comes thought, from our thoughts come feelings, from our feelings action, and from action outcome, which impacts the world around us. Without religion, some kind of mantra or code to guide him, the hero is lost. From the very first game, even when we had little information about either his past or his future aspirations, the one constant that Nathan Drake carried with him across his various journeys to territories uncharted was the religion of his adopted ancestor, greatness from small beginnings. No, this was, uh, this was Francis Drake's ring. I, you know, kind of inherited it. Sick parvis magna? Greatness from small beginnings. It was his motto. It's a phrase that simultaneously signifies Nathan Drake's yearning for greatness yet uncertainty about how exactly to capture it. What Nate is actually looking for in his adventures is a question that follows the player throughout the series. I'll get the story and you get whatever it is you're after. Is he just in it for the thrill, the money, the fame, or is there something more that motivates Nate to continuously seek out death-defying adventures? Nate continuing to explore the uncharted mysteries of the world despite being unable to answer exactly why is itself emblematic of the incredible importance of religiosity in making a great man. In his first essay on the divine hero archetype, Carlyle engages in a very lengthy philosophical defense of Scandinavian paganism. Why is this important? 
because Carlyle was a fairly devout Christian who abhorred the idea of pedestalizing the likes of Odin and Thor as if they were really divine. But he nonetheless defends the religion from those who describe it as being allegory, which in this context meant an untrue religion. Carlyle argued that whether or not paganism was a real religion, it had real significance to its practitioners. Its customs and teachings, such as Odin's discovery of letters and poetry, left an indelible mark on the history of that region of the world, which he himself is a descendant of, despite following a different faith. The point that Carlyle makes is that religion need only be significant to the practitioner. We learn, for example, in Uncharted 3 and expanded upon in Uncharted 4 that Nate is not in fact a descendant of Francis Drake. I suspect I know you better than anyone, Mr. Drake. Of course, that's not your real name, is it? But we won't dwell on that. The name and subsequently the motto were co-opted by the young Drake brothers. And Mom believed that Sir Francis Drake had ass. Who's to say he didn't? You're serious, aren't you? Nathan, we were meant for this. Nathan Drake. And yet, despite the false foundations on which his religious belief is grounded, the power of that mantra alone repeatedly allowed Nate to push himself beyond his own limits, to match wits with all manner of villains, and to follow in the footsteps of some of history's greatest men. Animated by Francis Drake's philosophy alone, the story of Uncharted demonstrates that Nate's continual perseverance toward end goals uncertain is itself an accidental credit to his greatness. For in the words of Sir Francis, the very first words we see in the entire series, there must be a beginning of any matter, but the continuing until the end, until it be thoroughly finished, yields the true glory. This demonstrates not only how important religiosity is to defining greatness, but how important sincerity is as well. While religiosity is the most foundational feature of greatness, Carlyle is very explicit in stating that sincerity is the most important. Sincerity, according to Carlyle, is an honest attempt to seek universal truth. It's a curiosity about the world around you and a desire to uncover its secrets. For Carlyle, this is the most basic element of greatness because, as previously discussed, religion is the ultimate determiner of reality. Again, from religion comes thought, from thought comes feeling, from feeling comes action. But in order to craft or adopt a religion, one must first have a genuine curiosity about the world. For without curiosity about the world, one cannot make observations about it. Without making observations about the world, one cannot form or subscribe to a religion. Sincerity is the quintessential mark of a great man, something that Carlyle routinely identifies throughout his essays as deserving of respect, even when he disagrees with the great man in question. As we discussed in his first essay on the divine archetype, Carlyle defends the sincerity of paganism despite being a Christian. He has some very choice words to say about paganism, calling it a bewildering, inextricable jungle of delusions, confusions, falsehoods, and absurdities. But he nonetheless considered Odin to be its sincere figure, whose fascination with the natural world inspired a belief in pagan deities, and therefore paganism must also be considered sincere as well. Insincerity, on the contrary, would be those whose pursuits are worldly and egotistical. Those who pursue money, fame, or fortune, and for whom a curiosity about the larger world and their place in it is little more than an afterthought. In the story of Uncharted, Nathan Drake's many successes throughout his adventures can be attributed to exactly this kind of sincerity. From the time he was young, Nate possessed an intense curiosity for history, in part motivated by the life's work of his late mother. Those were our dinner conversations. We were uh, a weird family. The artifacts impressed him, the stories inspired him, and he ultimately developed a reverence for history that followed him into adulthood. That same childlike sincerity is apparent throughout Nathan Drake's journeys. Nate is often one of the only ones in the room who actually cares for the historical significance of their adventure, not just its potential financial gain. He expresses genuine care and concern for the various artifacts that they uncover, even when they aren't necessarily related to the ultimate prize. Straight. Who the hell cares? Well, I care. Even parts of the game's mechanics seem reflective of this. There are many treasures that you can collect along the way, 
some of which likely possess great value, but they're ultimately little more than a distraction that isn't necessary to advance the story. It tends to be the priceless artifacts of significant historical value that capture Nate's real attention, and which more often than not, he's willing to lay down his life to either find or prevent these artifacts from falling into the wrong hands. By contrast, all of the game's antagonists are the exact opposite. They're backstabbing scoundrels and thieves whose interest in pursuing the game's treasure is motivated by pure selfish desire, with each coveting some combination of money, power, or fame. Notions like historical significance or universal truth are all meaningless to them, and in every occasion each of them is symbolically consumed by their misguided ambitions. Roman being zombified by the curse of El Dorado, Lazarevich being destroyed by the power of the Chintamani Stone, Marlow being swallowed by the sands of Atlantis, and Rafe being crushed by Avery's treasure. All of this relates to the final feature of greatness that Carlyle covers in his essays, the importance of detachment. By detaching oneself from the need for greatness, Carlyle envisioned a level of spiritual purity that only truly great men were able to reach. In discussing the hero as priest archetype, of which he uses Martin Luther as an example, Carlyle writes, I will call this Luther a true great man. Great not as a hewn obelisk, but as an alpine mountain, so simple, honest, spontaneous, not setting up to be great at all, there for quite another purpose than being great. Likewise, the most prominent arc in the Uncharted series is Nathan Drake's maturation on the meaning of greatness. He initially conceives of greatness as being indelibly linked to the outcome, to the point where he rejects his cherished heirloom upon finding Sir Francis's remains and assuming he never made it to El Dorado. Nate? It's Drake. He never found it, he just died here. So much for greatness. Wasted his life for nothing. By the third game, we come full circle to that moment once again. Only this time, Nate willingly gives up the ring, not out of shame, but because he has learned to detach himself from the outcome. Drake! Are you worthy of the name? Earn this, as Francis earned it from Elizabeth. Prove your greatness! I got nothing to prove. He learns that greatness is not pursued for greatness' sake. Such insincere sentiments result in the kind of self-destruction that befell each of the game's villains. It was only by being content with who he was, not needing to be the heir to the Drake name, and not needing to be remembered in history, that they truly captured the essence of greatness. As represented in Carlyle's Great Man Theory, these basic elements of greatness have been a near-universal staple of the heroic archetype across many different media for hundreds of years. As we've seen, Uncharted is certainly no exception to this, displaying the influence of this worldview prominently in the characterization of its main protagonist. But where it diverges from this tradition, and I think offers the most thought-provoking message, is in its ability to critique the assumptions behind this worldview in the first place. Carlyle goes to great lengths to present his theory of great men in history as being an unbiased analysis of the hero archetype. He pulls examples of heroes from many regions of the world, from religions which he disagrees with, such as Muhammad and Islam, and ideologies that he despises, such as Rousseau and democracy. Carlyle was an ardent authoritarian, by the way. But the truth of the matter is that all historical narrative possesses bias, something that the story of Uncharted expertly demonstrates throughout the series. Each game's plot involves demystifying the history behind great men, their exploits, and the treasures they sought. By the end of each game, there is a reversal of truth moment where the conventional historical narrative gives way to a previously unrevealed history. In Uncharted 1, it's the realization that the City of Gold was really a golden idol housing a deadly curse, and that, rather than dying before he could find it, Francis Drake willingly sacrificed himself to ensure it never reached civilization. In Uncharted 2, it's the realization that the fabled lost fleet of Marco Polo had actually discovered Shambhala and housed remnants of the Chintamani Stone. 
which itself wasn't a stone at all, but rather hardened sap from the Tree of Life. In Uncharted 3, it's the so-called Jinn of Iram being a hallucinogenic agent that caused the ancient city to tear itself apart. By the time we've completed these three games, the series has already primed us to understand the difference between history and our perception of it. But in the final game, Naughty Dog brings this thematic plot point to a masterful conclusion. The plot of Uncharted 4 sees Nathan Drake once again venturing into uncharted territory, this time in search of the ultimate prize, the lost treasure of the famed pirate king Henry Avery. From the various pieces of dialogue we get, we begin to craft an historical narrative, firstly about Henry Avery and secondly about the fabled pirate colony that he founded. Initially, Sam's dialogue depicts Henry Avery as an outlaw, but an almost Robin Hood-esque one, a penitent thief who defied the laws and conventions of civil society in favor of living as a free man. Avery sure had a thing for St. Dismas, huh? Well, Avery fancied himself a good thief, right? Only plundered and murdered the non-British evens. <laughs> Guess that's what passed for good back then. One can only imagine that his perception of Avery is no doubt a product of the stories that he and Nate were told by their mother as children. Romanticized stories about pirates, treasure, and freedom. Of Libertalia, the narrative is similarly romantic, the impression being that the colony was a kind of libertarian utopia where Avery and his fellow pirates lived in peace and equality away from the shackles of the outside world. We found Libertalia. <laughs> Liber... Liber what are you? Libertalia. Seems Avery founded the legendary pirate colony. Uh, it's more of a pirate utopia, really. Okay, but what about the treasure? See, as the story goes, this place provided a safe haven for hundreds, maybe even thousands of pirates, and they, they shared everything. Property, resources... Money? And they kept it all in one common treasury building. Okay, so... But as we get closer to the endgame and actually arrive on the island itself, the writers disrupt this narrative by interweaving various primary source artifacts from Avery's time period that begin to illustrate a much different narrative about who Avery really was and what Libertalia was really all about. The first instance of this occurs while exploring the hidden cave near St. Dismas' Cathedral. Atop a pile of skeletal remains, Nate finds an ominous letter from one Thomas Howard, a pirate captain who referred to himself as an old compatriot of Henry Avery. He vaguely mentions something about paradise, which at that point in the game we don't yet understand the implications of, and ends the letter by cursing Avery for indirectly causing his impending doom. It's our first sign that not everything about this fabled pirate utopia or its enigmatic founder is what it seems. As we continue to discover more artifacts along our journey, we're given new insight into Avery and Libertalia's true character. The first letter from Thomas Howard could easily be written off as the disgruntled writings of a man close to death. But as Sam and Nate explore the islands in and around Libertalia, they uncover more evidence that gives this seemingly innocuous letter more validity. The two find a large statue of Henry Avery himself, causing Sam to jokingly ponder whether Avery was a secret narcissist. You know, we're starting to get the feeling that our friend was a bit of a narcissist. You think? <laughs> yes. Those suspicions are confirmed when they reach the main island and find even more statues of Avery prominently displayed in public areas for the entire colony of Libertalia to see. By endgame, Avery's mask is completely removed, with our final primary source being a letter from Avery himself, ordering his men to move his treasure, flood New Devon, and betray his first mate Thomas II, who had not long prior done Avery's dirty work by poisoning the other founders. Of course, in addition to learning more about Avery, we soon also discover the truth behind what happened to Libertalia, we first find a letter from a young conscript named Christopher, whose writings to his family back home corroborate what the popular impression of Libertalia was. His letter is affectionate and hopeful, describing this yet unnamed colony as a place where every man is equal and free to do as they wish. Only a few minutes later, we find an engraving in a courtyard with a set of rules on it, something one wouldn't expect to find in a free colony of pirates. There's even a jail, and Sam and Nate actually ponder the possibility that the inhabitants of Libertalia might have even paid taxes. In more ways than one, this so-called utopia providing an alternative to the shackles of modern society begins to look increasingly like a reflection of that society, even replicating the same class divisions. For example, we learn that Avery and the other founders lived apart from the other colonists in their own high-priced elite district of the colony. 
The ultimate reveal, of course, is the discovery of the desecrated treasury, whose murals of the founders have all been marked with the word thief after the founders absconded with all the money. These primary source artifacts illustrate a vastly different narrative than the one presented to us at the beginning of the game and call into question almost everything about the preceding information and evidence we received. All the intricate modeling, the blueprints outlining a grand design for Libertalia, the expert engineering work that Nate so often marveled at, was it all a ploy, a smokescreen, for Avery to hide his true intentions and character? It illustrates that rather than a penitent Robin Hood, Avery was a thieving scoundrel whose entire reason behind creating Libertalia was to rob his competitors blind. In presenting its narrative in this way, a manner so subtle that it can easily be missed if not explored by the most curious of players, the game reveals the inherent superficiality of what we call history and forces us to pay attention to what gets lost in our popular perception of it. In the void between our account of history and the true account of history, how do we account for which sources we use to fill that void? Whose perspectives and opinions matter and whose do not? Which events do we consider instrumental and which ones are insignificant? And what assumptions are we making therein? This dilemma forms the foundation of the ideology of historiography. As opposed to history, Historiography is the study of how we study history. It examines not the who, what, where, when, but why we interpret history the way that we do, and how we came to interpret it that way to begin with. It's an academic discipline that acknowledges the discrepancy between the true history and our account of history. The first principle of historiography, then, is to understand that all history is narrative and therefore has bias. The historiographical method is an imperfect attempt to pierce through the narrative and grasp a more universal truth. Uncharted's story, then, can be viewed as a kind of historiographical exercise that emphasizes the shortcomings of such narratives, in its case, Carlyle's Great Man Theory. Unlike Carlyle's Great Man Theory, Uncharted is willing to ask not just what greatness is, but why we need it. While it does embrace elements of the Great Man Theory as we've discussed, it simultaneously offers a very pointed critique about the nature of our relationship to great men and the dangers associated with our celebration of them. The act of celebrating great men is something that Carlyle refers to as hero worship. According to Carlyle, hero worship is something that all societies practice. He argues that on a psychological level, we crave examples of heroic figures to help guide us through life's many unknowns. In the ancient world, men who revealed hidden truths about the world were prone to attract a following, hence prone to make history. But inherent to Carlyle's theory is an assumption about the relationship between the human condition and hero worship, one that positions hero worship as not just universal, but necessary. If some of the features of greatness that we covered in the first half of this video sound familiar, don't be surprised. Religiosity, sincerity, being detached from greatness, all these selfless characteristics have a very Christ-like quality to them on purpose. Carlyle, being the devout Christian that he was, considered Jesus to be essentially the world's first hero, and he therefore filters his definition of greatness through these qualities. By worshipping men who possessed Jesus-like, i.e. heroic, qualities, he envisioned the potential for a kind of non-denominational proliferation of Jesus worship throughout the world. Understanding the assumptions motivating his theory is crucial in contextualizing the overwhelmingly deterministic nature of the theory's definition of greatness. The logic goes that if Jesus was the first hero, and heroes are those who possess Jesus' qualities, then these heroic men must be destined for greatness as a precondition of their birth, as part of a grand design. Indeed. Carlyle was a firm believer in the old adage that great men are born, not made. Part of what motivated him to write the essays in the first place was to respond to the notion that heroes are a product of their time. He argued the contrary, citing the existence of various dark times in history as evidence that great men must be born, otherwise why didn't any great men rise to the challenge of those times and bring about peace and light? This sentiment is of course one that we're all very familiar with and which is an inseparable part of much of our modern literature via tropes like The Chosen One. And its influence is not lost on Uncharted either. There's a constant reference throughout the games to the concept of worthiness and destiny. For those who prove worthy, paradise awaits. 
those who prove false behold your grim fate. Yeah, well, I guess Avery was a better pirate than a poet. The worthy pilgrim is granted a golden passport to conquer obstacles on his journey to Shambhala. You will not stand in the way of destiny! And I promise you and me together, we're gonna go fast. Destiny. The implication is fairly clear, that Nathan Drake persists where others perish and succeeds where others fail because he is worthy because he is destined for greatness. What else accounts for his singular ability to crack hundred-year-old unsolved riddles, to survive against armies of enemies with little more than a small set of arms and munitions, and even combat the supernatural? But while on the surface it seems to embrace this line of logic, Uncharted simultaneously critiques this deterministic mindset by illustrating its destructive power, not just on the great man, but on those around him. One of the central conflicts in Uncharted 3 is Nate wrestling with the consequences of internalizing this belief. The game begins with a quote from Lawrence of Arabia. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night, in the dusty recesses of their minds, wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men. For they may act their dream with open eyes to make it possible. This I did. In his references to dreams and the possibilities of the day, Lawrence is cautioning the reader about the tendency of great men to become lost in their ambitions, to the point where they make possible even that which should remain as dream only. This serves as an early primer for what will happen to Nate throughout the remainder of the game. The game sees Nate and company once again tracking down a lost city, this time the Atlantis of the Sands, an ancient set of ruins that thanks to a fabled supernatural power and the deception of Sir Francis Drake, had been buried for hundreds of years. While all this seems like routine fare for Nate and his pals, his friends repeatedly call Nate out for being uncharacteristically invested in their latest pursuit. For run-of-the-mill thieves like Chloe Fraser, who is fairly new to these types of grandiose escapades, it's understandable that her interest in pursuing Iram would wane as the danger mounted. What is it with you? What are you trying to prove? I'm not trying to prove anything. Right. But even Sully, Nate's right-hand man and surrogate father who has been with him for nearly every grand adventure, seems worried that this time, Nate might be motivated by the wrong reason. I'm losing the plot here. Remind me again why we're doing this. No, 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 no. If you're gearing up for one of your I'm too old for this speeches, spare me. Nate, these guys are playing for keeps. Yeah, so? What, you're just gonna roll over for them now? Nobody's talking about rolling over. Then quit acting like you're ready to lay down and die, all right? Listen, kid. I've had you back for 20 years. I'm not going anywhere. Obviously. I just want to make sure we're doing this for the right reasons. You got your pride all tangled up in this thing. It's making you reckless. I taught you better than that. You're gonna get yourself killed. Ugh, damn. Reason. That reason, of course, being ego, a concept that Carlyle is particularly critical of in his essays. Carlyle uses political theorist Jean-Jacques Rousseau as an example of a man who, though others might consider him great, he personally did not. In his view, what constrained Rousseau's greatness was his ego, his obsession with proving something to other men and wanting other men to know of his greatness. Now, it's important to note that Carlyle is more than likely critical of Rousseau simply because Rousseau's philosophy was instrumental in inspiring pro-democratic ideals throughout Europe and Carlyle is a fairly staunch authoritarian. But the point still remains that when great men internalize their greatness, allow it to consume them and control them, that it can lead to both their destruction and the destruction of those around them. In Uncharted, this mindset caused Nate to reject his happy home life with his wife Elena and ultimately wrecked their marriage. It also caused both Charlie Cutter and Sully to almost lose their lives. Now, we've already discussed that Nate does eventually grow out of this mindset and learns the true meaning of greatness by the end of Uncharted 3, which is consistent with the basic structure of Carlyle's Great Man Theory. 
but the difference is in how Nate arrives at that conclusion on greatness. In Carlyle's theory, the conclusion is a foregone one. It's already assumed that great men will discover the true meaning of greatness because of the innate characteristics that they possess. This reveals the greatest discrepancy between Carlyle's theory of great men in history and in my opinion, the true account of how men rise to greatness. You have to remember the deeply embedded Christian theology of Carlyle's theory. Jesus' struggle was a singular one. Yes, he had help along the way. The man offering to help Jesus carry his cross on the way to the crucifixion, the disciples and other followers who communed with Jesus and tended to his body after death, but ultimately these figures in history were not meant to be instrumental to Jesus' success. Likewise, Carlyle does not spend a considerable amount of time discussing the people around the great men that he profiles in his essays, and how they contributed to their trajectory toward greatness, since he considers that trajectory to be a foregone conclusion. But in the story of Uncharted, Nate would never have reached his greatest heights without the help and love of the people around him. In true Christ-like fashion, Carlyle envisioned the archetypal great man as being a light unto others, saying, we cannot look, however imperfectly, upon a great man without gaining something by him. He is the living light fountain, which it is good and pleasant to be near. But more often than not, it's the people around Nate that guide him. Sure, as it relates to the business of finding lost cities, Nate is usually the one that their group looks to for leadership. What's the play here, Nathan? Just follow my lead. But without his friends having his back throughout his adventures, Nate would not have survived, on too many occasions to count. There's quite an apt metaphor for this in the sequence in Uncharted 3, where Nate is led through the desert by visions of Sully, directly contradicting the idea of Nate being a light, and instead literally positioning Sully as Nate's guiding light or spirit. In addition, Carlyle also characterized great men as being a net positive to those around them, saying, great men taken up in any way are profitable company. But in fact, on the contrary, in Uncharted, Nate's friends are more often than not in danger because of him and his never-ending thirst for adventure. This is a lesson Nate almost learns the hard way when he believes he almost caused Sully's death in Uncharted 3. But he doesn't quite grasp the sentiment fully until he's the one on the receiving end of it. In Uncharted 4, Sam's fabricated story about Alcazar forces Nate out of retirement to search for Henry Avery's treasure almost costing him his marriage again, and, this time, his life. The pure, senseless, ego-driven nature of the whole expedition doesn't truly sink in until Nate is nearly killed by Rafe as a result of Sam's lies. You know what? He did it all with me. Oh, oh yeah? No, that's bullshit. Oh. Sam, care to refute? Nate. Oh, Sam. Jesus, no, no. Avery's treasure was ours. It was always ours. I left my life for you! Notice that Sam again appeals to destiny as the reason for his actions. He and his brother were meant to find the treasure, therefore justifying his treachery. In Sam, Nate is finally able to see a reflection of himself and his old ways that brings his maturation on greatness to its conclusion. It harkens back to one of the most poignant monologues in the series from his then estranged wife Elena. Why, Nate? That's what we're here to find out. No, I mean, why this obsession? I'm I'm just worried. I can take care of myself, all right? I'm not talking about you. <laughs> what, Sully? He would go to the ends of the earth for you, Nate. Just don't ask him to. This quote represents the defining narrative achievement of Uncharted, a willingness to challenge our popular perception of great men and ask the question of propriety not possibility. Not can great men do great things, but should they, and at what cost? This is all particularly ironic because Carlyle envisioned his great man theory as being a remedy to humanity's tendency to worship the wrong type of hero. He thought that by enumerating the virtues of great men, that people might develop a renewed appreciation for them, and subsequently a better sense of which men were worthy of worship and emulation. What he never imagined was that our very obsession with hero worship itself might be the problem. Treating greatness in a vacuum as Carlyle does, ignoring the ways in which uncontrolled hero worship allows the rise of great but egoistic men who become the despots, tyrants, and villains that terrorize history, 
prevents us from examining the flaws inherent to our celebration of heroes and the heroic ideal. Ultimately, while using the visual and narrative language of the traditional great man archetype, Uncharted offers a modern, stripped-down version of this popular theory of history that emphasizes the man in great man theory, for underneath the greatness is a human like all of us. The entire structure of the final game exemplifies this sentiment. At the beginning of the game, the very first thing we're greeted to is one of the most anticlimactic title screens in the series, a deathly quiet setting devoid of the series' iconic musical fanfare. It's appropriately adorned with a single visual, the swaying corpse of a dead pirate. By the time we get to the climax of the game, the message is hammered home when Nate finds the fabled Pirate King's remains, a pile of bones pathetically slumped next to a treasure that he never even got to enjoy. So what? I don't know as much about history as you boys, but I've got a pretty good idea who those two are. Well, enlighten us. It's Avery and two. They killed each other. Good for them. What's the point? Everyone obsessed with this treasure gets what they deserve. For all their greatness and all their glory, these empty husks are all that await great men in the end the same as us all. Most of us crave greatness, but we'll never reach it. Most of us will never be millionaires or politicians or high-powered CEOs. Most of us will never make history. But through the story of Nathan Drake's, Uncharted argues that maybe that's okay. It's funny because it's a conclusion that Carlyle himself comes to toward the end of his essays, but for very different reasons. While Carlyle cautioned the reader to avoid becoming obsessed with greatness, he did so because of his belief in a higher power, since in his mind everything was preordained, stressing about trying to achieve greatness when the outcome was already set in stone was pointless. But Uncharted instead ponders the possibility that there is no destiny, that there is no path that you have to follow or some great calling that you have to find, and that the story we've been told about great men in history is at best incomplete and at worst, a lie. After all his globe-trotting history-chasing endeavors, Nathan Drake chose to live a simple life doing what he loved, with his great exploits being little more than old relics in a drawer. Maybe he'll not be remembered in the history books along with Marco Polo or T.E. Lawrence or Francis Drake, but he will be remembered by the people he loves and for the life that he lived as a father, a husband, a brother, and a friend. And maybe for Nate, and for all of us, that can be enough.